For my third year of university, I was planning on moving into a large four-bedroom house with the three girls I'd lived with during second year. We'd gotten quite close over the previous two years, and I was more than happy to spend my third and final year with them. But in the last few weeks before summer break, I spotted a sign in the window of a house on my way back from uni, and not just any old house either. This house was on my regular route back from university, meaning that I'd walked past it a hundred times over the previous eight months or so, and if I'm perfectly honest, I was obsessed with it. It sat on the elbow on a crook street that was mostly terraced houses, and it stood out not only because it was detached, but because it has this cozy cottage vibe that appeared refreshingly out of place. It was the kind of house that I could see myself growing into a crazy old cat lady in, and I can assure you, I mean that in the best possible sense. It had a tiny little garden out front, and from the looks of things, an outdoor cat who would let me pet her whenever she was sitting on the wall outside. All in all, it added up to my dream home, so imagine my excitement when I see a room for let sign in the window. I made a note of the email address printed on the small homemade sign and then practically ran back home to write up a first draft. Oh, and I mean first draft. The email said to send over a phone number and a brief introduction, but I think I must have hit about 600 words before I realized that it was getting out of hand. I definitely went overboard in terms of hyping myself up and heaping praise on their home, but I wanted to live there so, so badly, and when the couple who owned the home got back to me, I wanted it even more. They were a lovely husband and wife couple named Jen and Andrew and the rent that they were asking for was about half what the other landlord wanted for our four-bedroom place. I wouldn't even have to feel bad about backing out of my flatmates, as we'd had a mutual friend who'd jump at the chance to live with them. Once we had all the things hashed out, I moved in as soon as the lease on my old place ran out, and so began about two to three weeks of just absolute bliss. Jen and Andrew were a hard-working, professional, and outgoing couple, meaning I sometimes had the entire house to myself for 13 or 14 hours at a time. That kind of peaceful environment was exactly what I needed for my third and final year of study, and the whole place was decorated so nicely that moving in amounted to a dream come true. I was technically living in their future child's bedroom up in their attic conversion, but they left the decor very neutral, which again was exactly what I needed for long periods of focused study. I still led a fairly active social life, but whereas my old flatmate's place became the party house during the weekend, I had this consistent crib of comfort to come home to whenever I needed some peace and tranquility. It was every student's dream in a way, and at the time, I thought that I was the luckiest girl in the world. But if I'd have known what a slow drip nightmare that I'd just gotten myself into by moving in, I wouldn't have felt nearly so fortunate. Like I said, Living there for the first six weeks or so was a dream. I was given my privacy and treated very respectfully, which I suppose is what made the sudden but subtle change easier to notice. One day, I came home from university and the porch door was closed. Now, I always closed the porch on my way out. Always. Out of respect for Jen and Andrew, I wanted to keep the heat in and save them a few quid on bills. However, on that morning, I slept through my alarm. To get to my first morning lecture, I had to just throw on some clothes, rely on a hat to hide my bedhead, and rush out of the house with just a few dabs of roll-on deodorant and some chewing gum to give the appearance of hygiene. Not my finest hour, but such is life as a student. I knew for a fact that I didn't close the porch door that morning, possibly for the first time since I'd been living there. But like I said, when I got back to the house, it was closed. Later that day, I remarked to Jen and Andrew at dinner that one of them had been home that day, and both denied it. I wasn't confrontational or snarky about it, but I told them someone must have been home, because the porch door had been open. Both shrugged it off, told me that no one else had a key, and assured me in the nicest possible way that I must have been mistaken. I was so sure that I wasn't. I mean, 99.9% .9 certain, because if I'd have closed it shut at the speed that I was going... I swear that I'd have shattered one of the door's panes of glass. But then if neither Jen nor Andrew said that they'd been home, there were no signs of forced entry or burglary, then maybe was nothing to worry about. Now don't get me wrong, I knew for certain someone had been home. I didn't feel that I was going mad or anything, I just didn't see it for the red flag that it was. 
not until it was too late. The point where I properly realized that Andrew wasn't quite the sweet married man that I thought he was was the run-in I had with him outside the upstairs bathroom. I'll do you the good courtesy of not getting into the nitty-gritty of what I was doing in there, but I was in there for a good few minutes. When I finish up, I wash and dry my hands, and then when I open up the bathroom door, there's Andrew, standing right in front of me. He wasn't leering at me or anything, he was just smiling. I gave him an awkward greeting, expecting him to move out of my way, but he didn't. He just let a few more awkward seconds tick by before saying, Sorry, I was just waiting for you to finish. I told him it was fine, even though it bloody well wasn't, then he finally stepped out of my way and let me pass. God knows how long that he was standing out there just listening to me or whatever. We generally operated a, if the bathroom door is closed, it's in use policy too, so I know something wasn't right about him, just standing out there silently. That was a really rough night if I'm being honest. I thought I'd found my dream setup for my final year and I thought Andrew was this wholesome, dedicated husband who wouldn't dream of making me uncomfortable. It wasn't a complete disaster if he turned out to be a bit of a creep, but it was just really disappointing, I suppose. Andrew went back to his best behavior for about a week after that, but just as I was starting to think that the whole bathroom thing had been a hideous misunderstanding, things escalated considerably. One night at about three in the morning, I get a phone call from one of my old flatmates. She was out drinking, there had been an incident with a boy, and she was both very drunk and very upset. I stayed up to talk to her for a few minutes, made sure that she was in a taxi on her way home, and then told her that I'd call her again in the morning. After that, I hung up and realized that I needed to nip to the toilet before heading back to bed. I rolled out of bed, put my very fluffy robe on, then crept towards my bedroom door to open it, only to find that it was already open. I always close my door at night, always, especially after the whole bathroom run-in when I started to feel like Andrew's interest in me was less than wholesome. But then that night, my door was ever so slightly ajar. My heart started to pound as I realized someone had been watching me sleep, and me rolling over to answer my friend's call had been the thing to scare them off. If I'd stayed asleep, I imagined that they'd have just quietly closed my door again, but since I was awake, the sound of it suddenly closing would have most definitely alerted me to their presence. That whole thought chain that went through my head at a mile a minute, and suddenly, I didn't feel so much like going for a wee anymore. The darkness in the hallway outside terrified me, so I just closed my door, got back into bed, and tried my best to go back to sleep. I woke up tired, anxious, and bursting to pee, and my morning didn't get much better after that. I met up with the friend that I told you about, the one having boy trouble, and I got about five minutes into a conversation with her before I just broke. I tried my best to hold back the tears, with us being in public and all, but it was so hard. I was heartbroken, exhausted. I didn't even want to go back to the place I'd once been head over heels in love with. Now I know this might sound like a major first world problem to some people. Oh, a man made me feel uncomfortable, woe is me, but look at it from my perspective. There was a progression to it, this sort of slow escalation. And if I didn't do something about it, it was bound to get worse. I ended up talking the whole thing out with her over a few cups of tea back at her place and... We hashed out a sort of plan. If I really loved that place as much as I said it, and I didn't want to let Andrew's creepy behavior force me out, I had to get a lock on my door. Jen and Andrew hadn't thought to have one fitted, and I had a feeling that asking for one might get a bit awkward. But if I wanted to be safe while staying there, I needed to ask about one. I can also hear you practically screaming at your devices, saying, why didn't you move out as soon as you realized you were in danger? Well. I didn't actually think that I was in any actual danger. Having my privacy invaded, yes, in a big way. But did I think that there was a serious threat to my life? Not really. I wouldn't be seeing Andrew in quite the same light again, but I knew all I needed to do was get a lock and potentially warn Jen about her husband's behavior, and that might well resolve the issue. There's also the third factor that has kept me from just packing up all my stuff and just getting the bloody hell out of there. If I was a first year with time to play with, then yeah, maybe I'd have done just that. But this was my third year, the most crucial of my degrees, so 
Couch surfing and looking for a new place would eat into my study time, ruin my focus, and potentially jeopardize my whole degree. I was stuck between a rock and a hard place, so I weighed up my options and I decided that staying at the cottage would be my best bet. When I raised the prospect of a lock on my door with Jen, it was just as awkward as I had imagined, but also the most British kind of awkward imaginable. I caught her on a weekend, asked her very politely, and she said yes right away. I actually thought the awkwardness was averted, but as I was walking away, Jen was like, Is everything okay? I just didn't know how to address the issue there and then, knowing that it amounted to accusing her husband of slowly escalating harassment, so I didn't. I just said yes, everything was fine. It's just that the whole lock thing had been on my mind for a while, and I wanted to ask if it was okay. It was obviously going to be their kid's room at some point, so a lock wouldn't be needed, but she agreed that they could simply remove it when the time came. I told her everything was okay, but I know that she didn't believe me, not 100% anyways. If I trusted them completely, if nothing was happening to make me feel uncomfortable, then I wouldn't be asking for one, and she knew that as well as I did. I was actually a bit worried that she'd just ask Andrew to do it, in which case he'd know that I'd try to go behind his back with my request. But she didn't. She said that she'd get a handyman to do it since she and Andrew were both so busy with work. Now a few days go by and I hear nothing back about the lock and then after a week, I decided to give Jen a nudge about it. She apologized, told me that it had completely slipped her mind, and promised to get on it as soon as possible. But that didn't do anything for me, not really, because the same pattern of behavior was due to repeat itself. And in case you hadn't noticed, Andrew would do something, or something weird would happen with my room or belongings, and then he'd back off for a little while as if his compulsion was satisfied. Around the time I reminded Jen about the lock, Andrew had been quiet for a while, and since I was due an incident, I decided to employ one of the tactics my friend and I had talked about. We'd thrown around the idea of getting like a little miniature camera, a nanny cam as they're called sometimes, as a way of catching Andrew in the act. A piece of tech like that was way beyond my very humble student budget, but then we realized that I already had a piece of surveillance equipment, or rather, something which would be easily made as a sort of ad hoc surveillance device. My laptop. I just had to keep it open and facing the door, maybe with a sort of sleep mode or black screen app to make it look switched off and then just record a very long video using Windows Movie Maker or something. It would take up a lot of memory, and the picture might not be the best, but it was a solid enough plan to be put into action, and so that's what I did. Day after day, night after night, I secretly recorded my room whenever I was out or asleep. I hadn't really considered how much work it was going to be, sifting through video files that were anything from 7 to 10 hours long. And if it was what I needed to do before the lock was fitted, so be it. I was definitely ready to move out at that stage. Watching all that video was eating into my study time, but, and I know this might sound so lovey or naive, I felt a responsibility to Jen now. If her husband wasn't who she thought he was, and I just packed up and left her with him without even so much as a warning... What kind of person would that make me? I remember getting a text from her at the start of the week telling me that a handyman would be out on the Thursday to fit the lock. It was such a huge relief, but I also reckoned that I'd keep on secretly filming until then. And as much as I wanted to say that I'm glad that I kept it up, I don't think that I can mean it wholeheartedly. On the Wednesday, the day before the handyman was due to fit the lock, I arrived back from uni and got to time skipping through my ad hoc CCTV footage. I was so used to seeing absolutely nothing that when I skipped a one time marker and saw a figure in my room, I honestly recoiled a little bit in fright. It was, you guessed it, Andrew. I had had a bloody good idea that he'd been sneaking around my room, but to actually see it happening right there in front of me, I felt this kind of skin crawling nausea the likes of which I'd never felt before. At first, he just stood there, careful not to touch anything, just sort of looking around. I'm not claiming to be a psychic or anything, but it was like I could hear his thoughts. He'd obviously been told about the handyman fitting the lock, even if it was very late and in passing, and he wanted to make the most of his one final chance to snoop around my room before I 
had it under lock and key. He made it way over to this cork board that I had hanging from the one wall. Over the previous two years, I'd filled it with all kinds of pictures of me and my friends. Friends from uni, friends from back in Shrewsbury, pronounced in Polaroids and passport-sized pictures, a chaotic collage of memories and friends both old and new. Andrew crept up to it, looked at it for a few minutes, and then reached up to pluck one of the smaller passport-sized pictures from one overpopulated corner. I was furious, extremely creeped out, but absolutely livid too. Only, Andrew wasn't done yet. Photo in hand, he walked over to my bed and laid on it. Not on his back, but in a kind of rough fetal position, facing away from the camera. He stayed there long enough for me to think that he was sleeping, but then I saw him move. It was gentle at first, barely could see it at all, until you could quite clearly see him shaking, almost like he was sobbing, but I don't even know how to say this, more sustained maybe? I couldn't work out exactly what he was doing, but he stayed like that for a few minutes. I know what you're thinking, but if he was doing that, then he certainly didn't leave any trace of it. When he finished, he just got up, straightened out my sheets, and then left with the stolen picture. I finally had him on camera, sneaking around my room, acting like a lunatic and stealing my things. Not exactly crime of the century or anything, but now I could quite literally show Jen the kind of guy her husband really was. Now granted, doing so would be quite an intrusive act that might well destroy their marriage, but women have got to look out for each other, right? At least, that's what I was taught growing up. I didn't really dilly-dally over it, and I didn't let my new door lock put me off finally doing the right thing either. I waited until we could sit down together and have a proper chat, and then broke it to her as gently as possible. As I imagined, she was initially quite offended at such an accusation, but we'd known each other for months by this point, and she knew that I wouldn't make up some wild claim out of hand. Naturally, she wanted to see the evidence just to know for certain that what I was saying was true and when she watched the video clip I had isolated exactly for her, I could see that she turned pale. And when the clip was over, Jenny apologized profusely to me, told me that she'd make things right and then declared very grimly, I might add, I think I've got a phone call to make. I knew that they'd be some of the most difficult phone calls of her life so I went for a walk to give her a bit of privacy. And when I got back, she caught me in the hallway, and tears were still streaking down her face, and told me Andrew was going to find somewhere else to live for a while. I cried a bit too as I gave her a hug. I kind of felt like her little sister, you know, and for the next week or so, I tried to be there for her as best I could. But ultimately, Jen just wanted to be alone. Just over a week later, I came home from university to find that Jen was home early, she said that she'd taken a mental health day at work and had come home at lunchtime to put the Christmas decorations up, but when she got back, she didn't really much feel like decorating. I asked if she'd spoken to Andrew, and she had, but she didn't want to talk about it. She said that she couldn't really think about it without breaking down into tears, and there had been enough drama dumping on me for the time being. I told her that I'd be up in my room if she needed me, for anything, even if it was just a talk and she thanked me and I walked out into the hallway and up the stairs. I would only been up in my room for a few minutes when my phone started to buzz, and it was a text from Jen saying, cup of tea with a question mark. We take into communicating like that sometimes, very first world of us, I know, but it saved her walking up the two flights of stairs. I texted her back saying, love one, and then got down to studying like I used to before all the horribleness had started. A few minutes later, Jen showed up with my tea and then I got back to studying. Maybe 35 to 40 minutes later, I started to feel tired. Not just that usual later afternoon sluggishness either, I mean really lethargic. I drank the rest of the tea in gulps, hoping the little caffeine boost would see me through until the evening, but then just minutes later, I felt the exhaustion hit me like a brick wall and I could barely keep my eyes open. I kept a few blister packs of Pro Plus in my desk drawer, little caffeine pills that I used to take to pull all-nighters, and as I'm rummaging around looking for them, there's a knock on my door. It was Jen, 
wanting to know if I was feeling okay. She never came to my room like that, and there was something in the way that she looked at me that just seemed really out of character. It was like there was a question behind the question, and in a sudden moment of absolute horror, I realized what that question was. I tried to seem as awake as possible and told her, yeah, that I was actually thinking about going out with a few friends of mine for a bit. She forced a smile and then just sort of left me there alone. I dry swallowed about four of those caffeine pills and then called the friend who had the boy trouble from earlier that I mentioned, and I just said something like, I think they drugged me, please come and pick me up, call an ambulance if I stop texting back. I couldn't believe that I was texting someone those actual words. I even thought maybe I was being kind of paranoid. Never in a million years when I first moved in did I think that it had eventually come to something like that. Texting out an SOS, scared for my life, feeling completely and utterly betrayed by the one person I thought that I could trust. It was, and still remains, the worst night of my life. I made myself throw up to try and get whatever was left of that tainted tea out of me, but... My friend still drove me to the A&E when she arrived to pick me up. I was kept in hospital overnight and the nurses monitored my condition, but whatever I'd been given just made me sleep for almost 14 hours straight. And in that time, my friend had been in touch with the police to find out what kind of legal action I could actually take. But the sad fact was, unless I was tested right after I was brought into hospital, there was very little they could do. To test my blood or urine, they needed my consent, and for that, they'd need to be able to wake me up. And thanks to whatever Jen had slipped into my tea, I was basically dead to the world until early the following morning. I could still make a complaint, and the police would have a word with Jen to make sure that she had nothing untoward to tell them about Andrew, or maybe even me for that matter. And then this is the part that still gets me the most. When the police arrived to talk to Jen... Guess who was there with her? Like nothing had ever happened. Yeah, Andrew. They confirmed that yes, there had been a bit of a tiff, and Andrew had been staying with his parents over the weekend, but nothing I'd said was true. In fact, according to them, I'd been a complete pain in the butt from the start to finish, and they have suspected of me being involved in a burglary that they'd been subjected to because one of the things that had gone missing was, you guessed it, my laptop. The same laptop containing the only piece of evidence that anything remotely weird had happened in the first place. I went ahead with the blood and urine test just in case they'd pick anything up, but I had to wait weeks to get a negative result back and by that time, I was living in an emergency accommodation provided by the university. The police said that that didn't mean that I wasn't drugged or spiked as a lot of sedatives are out of your system in I guess 12 hours or so. It just meant that I pretty much had no legal recourse, as it was now just a case of he said, she said. My dad had driven over to help me get my stuff back, and funny enough, Andrew hadn't been present during the exchange, and all my stuff was boxed up outside, so no actual contact had to be made. My dad had wanted to give Jen and Andrew a piece of his mind, but it's not surprising that they didn't fancy anything like that. I think by the time I had gotten my stuff back, I was just happy to have closed such a nightmarish chapter in my entire life. I had totally resigned myself to police being no help whatsoever. I know it's not their fault. The fault lay in constraints in the law, so I just moved on and forgot about it ever happening, and I hope I never ran into them anywhere ever again. I try not to think about what would have happened if I had given in and taken a nap that day or or if I hadn't caught on to what was going on. I could handle knowing Andrew was some kind of closeted pervert, but thinking his wife was in on it and was about to sell me up the river for lying through her teeth for weeks. Like I said, after all that chaos and insanity, it just isn't worth thinking about. So back when I was in college here in Germany, me and a few friends of mine were invited to a house party one weekend. It wasn't sold as being some crazy all-night rave or anything like that, but since the drinking age is much lower than in the US, there had been a lot of beer, and it was certain to get pretty wild. In light of that, me and my friends were really excited. 
We knew that there were going to be girls, and being the young single guys that we were, we knew that it would be a great place to meet some potential dates and, you know, do some flirting. We arrived stinking of cologne, wearing terrible button-up shirts with our beer in tow, and then we set up in the corner and just sort of awkwardly were drinking amongst ourselves for a while. But then the more we drank, the more confident we got, and slowly but surely we started to mingle. One of my friends started putting it on with a few different girls, and at first it was funny to watch him struggle. He was our designated driver for the evening, meaning that he hadn't been drinking and was therefore still very nervous and pretty clumsy. But then, we saw that the attraction to one of the girls was very much reciprocated. We were happy for him, but as much as I'd like to tell you that we were mature and gave him some space, that wasn't the case at all. We kept harassing him and his potential date, playfully of course, but it was still unwelcome. Eventually he told us to leave them alone because we were ruining his chances with her and only then did we finally respect his wishes and just leave him in peace. We were pretty drunk by that period, so we just went off and entertained ourselves so he could get some space. Now a little time goes by and we start wondering where our sober friend and his lady are. We looked around everywhere for them, checking all of the bedrooms in the house, but all were occupied with people drinking or smoking and our friend seemed to be nowhere to be seen. But then, in the process of looking for him, we found the girl's friends, and after asking where the new couple was, we discovered that they'd gone out to my friend's car for some alone time together. We knew exactly what they were up to, and although the girl's friends made us promise to leave them alone, we just had to get a picture or two for posterity, being immature and whatnot, you know the deal. I fully admit that our plan made us total a-holes and that violating someone's intimate privacy is not only wrong, but also completely against the law to be honest and we didn't end up taking pictures or video of anyone that night as you'll soon come to learn. In order to maintain the element of stealth, only one of us would creep up towards my friend's car before secretly recording whatever was going on inside, that was the plan at least. And that person wasn't me, so the rest of us sort of held back at the party to make it look like we weren't doing exactly what it is we were doing. We talked to the girl's friends, kept them occupied trying and failing to flirt with them until we started to grow impatient. All our friend with the phone had to do was run up to the car, snap a few pictures and then run back with his prize. But longer and longer went by and there was no sign of our friend with the camera phone. Unable to wait any longer I went outside to look for him but instead of secretly filming our friend and his girl in the car, I found him sitting on the curb with no car in sight. He was on the phone with someone so I figured shutting up and listening would get more answers than asking questions he wouldn't respond to. As I listened, I worked out the call was obviously a serious one and by the end of it, I was almost certain that number one, he'd been crying, and number two, that the call sounded like it had been with the police. I asked him where our friend with the car was and he just shook his head and told me we need to leave. When he looked up at me, it became clear that yes, he had been crying, but why? He didn't tell me until we took a taxi back to his apartment and over a few more beers and some cigarettes, he told me what happened. He tried to take some pictures as planned, but when he got to our friend's car, he found him in the passenger seat alone. His head was in his hands and he was in this terrible state with tears streaming down his face. My friend with the phone kept asking what happened with the girl, over and over, and but our friend with the car wouldn't say anything. Wouldn't or couldn't, I don't know. But my phone friend walks around to the passenger side to climb in and talk to him with some privacy and he asks again, what happened with the girl? And our friend with the car just points to the back seat. And that's when he realizes that our friend isn't alone in the car. He never was. And that under the blanket on the back seat, he recognized the shape of a person. It was the girl that he'd been with and she wasn't breathing. But when my friend with the phone asked what had happened, car friend just kept saying, I don't know, I don't know. At first, he maybe thought that the girl had had a seizure, or maybe a freak heart failure, and he kept saying to call 112, which is the emergency number here in Germany for fire or medical. But my friend with the car, he wouldn't call. He kept saying things like, just wait a minute, I need to think, and other things to delay my other friend. 
My friend with the phone said that he jumped out of the car out of instinct, realizing that he was getting his DNA and all of those things onto what was now the scene of the crime, being very paranoid. There was no other reason why he would refuse to call the emergency number or try to delay in any way, or why he'd cover her body instead of just running to get help or maybe even trying to get her out. My friend with the phone then told the other to get out of his car, but he wouldn't. He just suddenly started the engine and drove off before my friend could stop him. He then was faced with a choice, run and get us, which is what he really wanted to do because he was completely freaked out, or do the right thing, be a man and just call the 110 number instead, which is not the number for medical, it's the number for the police. We later discovered that the friend with the car had somehow suffocated this girl, although we never found out exactly how. He planned to drive into the river Maine to take his own life and hide what he'd done, but he couldn't go through with it and was found by the police and subsequently arrested. He pled guilty to everything to try and get as little time in prison as possible and for a while it was a big story, but now for most people it's half a forgotten memory really. When I recall it, my mind always seemed to land on one specific thing my friend said when he was in his apartment afterwards. He said realizing that he sat in the car with a dead body, as well as the killer themselves, was the scariest feeling he'd ever felt. It's the kind of moment that would top anybody's list of their life's scariest moments. But he said that just seconds later he was faced with something that was somehow even more terrifying to him. He was terrified that one of the dead girl's friends was going to ask him where she was, and how he wouldn't be able to tell her. I just tried to be the best friend I could to him and get him away from the party before his worst fear came true. But I also understand how selfish it was of us not to warn anyone what had happened. Those girls might have carried on partying for a while, not knowing that one of their close friends was gone forever. My name is Tom, and I'd like to share a story from my college days. As you can probably imagine, it's not a very nice story, but I like to think that it's something others can take something away from, be that a life lesson or whatever else. I was pretty wild in college. You wouldn't think it if you looked at me, but it's true. I did okay in my freshman year, tried to keep my head straight and focus on my studies, but then the sophomore party lifestyle hit me pretty hard. I've also always looked a little older than I was, so although getting carded was standard on campus, if I drove into the city, I could pick up a six-pack almost anywhere. And that was not conducive to a healthy study and party balance. I would regularly find myself forced to walk home from some bar at 2am, having spent all my money on shots with no charge on my phone to call a cab. A normal person might have that happen to them once, but me... It happened at least half a dozen times than I can remember. The last time, I had just gotten back on the campus after walking maybe two or three miles completely drunk, and I was incredibly tired. I was sobering up, in a terrible mood, and all I wanted to do was get back to my dorm so I could get to that bottle of vodka that I kept hidden in my dorm. But then, I run into this kindly stranger. There's a guy smoking a cigarette outside his block, and he says something sort of softly to me as I walk past him. It was something like, crazy night, or wild night, and I must have just grunted until I saw him smoking. I asked him to bum one, and did so. Then we made a little small talk before he invited me inside for a beer and to charge my phone. This guy was still living in the dorms, albeit the nicer kind on the other side of campus, but having alcohol was still very much against the rules. Most heavy partiers had something stashed away somewhere, but this guy had a mini fridge that had beer cans tucked behind sodas. He said no one suspected him because he was such a nerd, and he was kind of right, I guess, because he didn't give off party vibes, but I just found myself seriously impressed. Well, more just wanting to have another beer before I walked the final 20 minutes to my dorm, but impressed nevertheless. I go up to this guy's room, and there it was, beer, hiding in plain sight. I asked to use the guy's bathroom before we drank, and he showed me where it was, and when I got back, we talked and drank, and at one point, I knew I probably should have started walking back, but I figured that I could just rest a little longer. And that, ladies and gentlemen, 
is the last thing I remember. I woke up the next morning in the hallway outside the guy's apartment. I was fully clothed, but my shoes were out there with me. It must have been late morning because it was pretty busy outside, meaning people definitely must have stepped over me while passed out in the hallway. I felt like death, and I probably looked about the same too. I know I attracted a few looks as I sort of moseyed across campus and back to my room. I'd been really drunk before, but never blackout drunk, and let me tell you, it was not a good feeling. I haven't even put it together why I'd been cruising along just fine before that one beer knocked me out completely cold. I honestly just figured that I was exhausted from hours of drinking then miles of walking, but as I said, I had made that walk five or six times previous, probably having drank even more on some occasions, and I'd never blacked out like that until that night. I figured a lot of you probably have put it together already. Things are sometimes clearer from a distance like that, you know? But never underestimate the power of denial, especially when it comes to young men. I think a year went by before I was really faced with what had happened to me. I always knew in the back of my head, I mean, but like I'd already covered, I had that head buried firmly in the sand. In the 12 months or so since I blacked out, the same thing happened to multiple guys from our university and even some of the locals too. They were walking someplace late at night ran into a kind of stranger who offered them beer or maybe a phone charge or whatever they just happened to need at that moment. They then went up to this guy's apartment or got into his car or whatever and he offers them a drink. And then boom, they wake up hours later with no memory of the evening's events. You might think that it'd be those with clear ideas or suspicions that it'd be the first to raise the alarm, but in reality, the opposite is true. The more of an idea that they had of what happened, the more compartmentalizing went on, allowing our seemingly kind stranger to get away with his crimes for a long time. It wasn't until a dude went to a doctor, having no idea why he hurt so much that the cops were even informed that something was going on on campus. Then I don't know how, but they caught up with the guy, arrested him, and then the whole story was in the media within just a few days. The cops think this kindly stranger assaulted anywhere between 18 to 100 different assaults in the space of two years. And you read that right. 18 confirmed, 100 possible, and I heard almost a dozen were almost talked into testifying, but withdrew one by one in the run-up to the trial itself. Testifying would mean admitting what had happened to them, something that some guys just aren't willing to do. I guess that applies to both sexes, but it especially applies to men. I know that because I was one of those who withdrew. I figured if so many others were brave enough to say it out loud, I wouldn't need to. But that's not how it works. The kindly stranger who invited me into his dorm room that night got more than 500 years in prison on account of the 18 separate accounts that he was convicted of, plus a bunch of other crimes thrown in there too. It was good news to most, but to me, it meant facing up to what had happened to me, which honestly has been the single toughest thing I'd ever had to do. I've since worked with an organization called One in Six, named so because statistically, one in six men will be intimately assaulted or violated at some point in their lives, but because of how little we talk about it, you'd think the number is much, much lower. Well, it's not. And if the issues I just discussed affects any of your viewers, I strongly advise them to go visit www.1in6.org. There's a lot of advice and information there. Just don't close yourselves off and suffer in silence. Because silence is the real killer. So back when I was a sophomore in college, I was dating a guy that we'll call Will. I won't give away too many details about him for reasons that'll become obvious as the story progresses. When we first met as freshmen, we couldn't have been any more mismatched. We were from opposite sides of the country. He was an English major while I was studying molecular biology. He was super outgoing and sort of right-brained while I was awkward, shy, and very much his complete opposite. I'm honestly amazed that we even hooked up in the first place, but we did. 
He got my number, and I almost regret giving it to him because he tried some really wicked cheesy pickup lines, but in the end, he convinced me to go on a date with him. We dated for the rest of the academic year, visited each other over summer, and by the holidays, he'd become my first serious boyfriend. We were happy, really happy, and until just after New Year's, when I noticed a sudden change in his behavior. Like I mentioned, Will was a perennial optimist and very much a social butterfly. He always wanted to see and do things while I was a total homebody, so when I noticed that he seemed more and more content to stay cooped up in his dorm room completely alone, it immediately struck me as odd. Our sophomore year meant that our studies started to ramp up, meaning time alone together was kind of at a premium. I didn't mind just hanging out in his dorm room with him, but sometimes I'd get there and he'd only just gotten out of bed. This was definitely out of character for him, and even more so was how downright cranky and cold that he seemed to be getting with me. One time I showed up and all he did for the first half hour was play some stupid video game, barely even acknowledging my presence until the game was done. When he couldn't seem to understand why I was mad, I admittedly got way angrier and he stormed off to take his first shower of the day at like 7.30pm. And while he was showering, my phone just so happened to buzz with a low battery notification, so I just went hunting for a charging cable. Will used to have the same phone as I did, and he had the old cable lying around somewhere, so when I was unable to locate it in the nest of wires behind his desk, I went searching through his drawers. And that's when I found a half-empty bottle of pills with the word, Vivance written on the label. He'd obviously been taking them, but I had no idea that he had any kind of condition or anything, so I quickly googled the name to see what they were for. The first result was like, Vivance is an anti-ADHD medication, and again, I had no idea that Will had ADHD, but that's not really what got my attention. It was the side effects. Hallucinations, paranoia, depression, harmful ideations, you name it and Vivance listed it as a side effect or overconsumption. I was almost certain that the pills were to blame for Will's sort of sudden behavioral shift, so naturally I wanted to step in, but I also didn't want to inflame the already present tensions that we had with each other. But sadly, there was no way to avoid it. When he came out of the shower, I asked him if he had anything he wanted to tell me. Now I know what you're thinking, and no, I didn't do it in a rude or accusatory way. I did it in an earnest, I love you but I'm worried about you kind of way, not wanting to prolong our conflict any further. Somehow, Will still took offense before flat out denying that he was hiding anything. I tried again, giving him a free pass for us to talk about the Vivance without me being remotely mad or judgmental, but again, he denied keeping anything from me. And that's when I straight up asked him, well what about the pills? And he freaked. He goes on this, how dare you snoop around in my room, you're not my effing mother, screaming and shouting and bawling up his fists. I'm not proud of it, but I just burst into tears. I've always been very conflict averse, and unfortunately sudden aggression just provokes this kind of stress reaction in me. The sight of my tears calmed Will down a little, and he agreed to talk about the pills. And here's what my initial theory was. Will had suffered with ADHD for years. He was embarrassed by it and kept it a secret. Since he was away from his mom and dad, he'd somehow messed up in his doses and was now suffering the side effects, but here's what was actually going on. Will had never in his life suffered from ADHD. Someone had sold him the pills as a sort of study aid, but instead, Will was using it to be better at that stupid video game that he'd been playing. He wasn't up studying all night like I thought he was. He'd been wasting his time trading insults with literal children. I couldn't hide how mad I was. I never heard anything so irresponsible in my entire life. I should have just dumped him right there and then, but I loved him. Go figure. So to his credit, Will admitted that what he was doing was extremely dumb and apologized for worrying me so much. He then took the bottle of Vivance out of the drawer and poured the remaining pills down the toilet and then flushed them away. Over the next few weeks, Will's behavior and sleeping pattern improved significantly and I can say with near certainty that he wasn't taking any meds. But what he was doing was drinking, and he was drinking a lot. As you could probably guess by now, Will was always big into parties, not even for the alcohol so much as the chance just to talk to people. 
He enjoyed a drink or two, but rarely more than that. He saw alcohol as a kind of social lubricant, and anywhere past his sweet spot, and he just called it and stopped being fun. Well, after the Vivance discovery, that all kind of changed. Will started drinking alone, and he wouldn't tell me why or where he was getting it. The most I ever got out of him was, I'm stressed. But when I asked him what was stressing him out, he just put up a wall and refused to talk about it. Slowly but surely, his sleeping pattern began to creep back to unhealthy territory, and after talking to one of his guy friends, I found out that Will was taking the pills again. Once again, I confronted Will, but that time I got a taste of what Vivance can do to a person. No matter what I said to him, he would only ever respond with, who told you? Then each time he asked, the question would get louder and more aggressive, and by the end, he was pinning me up against a wall by my shoulders while screaming, who told you? Who effing told you? The tears were streaming down my face. He didn't care. He just carried on screaming until he accepted that I was in no condition to talk. In that moment, I didn't think that I could get any more frightened of him and he soon proved me wrong. Will started pacing back and forth as I sat down, leaning down on my knees to hide my face. The only real sounds were his footsteps and my sobs, but suddenly, Will stopped in his tracks. He started staring at the dorm room's neighboring wall, then began hammering on it with his fist while screaming, Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! In the sight of someone you love, losing their mind right before your eyes is something that I wouldn't wish upon my worst enemy. It's terrifying and heartbreaking all at once because it's not them anymore. I can almost sympathize with my ancestors who believe such people were possessed by demons. They're kind of right in a way because they're not in control of themselves. Something else is at the wheel. I was too scared to ask Will what he could hear that I couldn't because the answer didn't matter. Not really. After that, I got in touch with Will's mom. I didn't have her number, but after looking up his sister's Facebook account, a quick friend request was all it took to get a hold of it. I called her and told her everything, and she was amazing. She thanked me for caring, assured me that she'd take over from there, and promised that she'd be in touch with any developments. A day went by, and my love you, hope you're okay text with Will went unanswered. I called his mom, and she assured me that she was working on it. But a few hours later, I got a text from Will asking me to come pick him up in an Uber. This was a huge red flag because Will loved driving and he loved his car. Either he was drinking heavily again or something had happened. Well, something had happened. Will had totaled his car, and my jaw dropped when he told me on the phone that it hadn't been an accident. He'd purposely destroyed his own car because he thought his parents were using it to track him, and it later turned out that he was half right that his parents had hired a PI to keep an eye on him while they arranged for a stay in rehab. It was a well-intentioned gesture, but given how prone to paranoid delusions Will was at the time, it wreaked absolute havoc on his psyche. But that wasn't all. He wanted me to call us an Uber so we could flee to Canada. According to him, not his parents nor the US government could track him on the other side of the border. Therefore, if we wanted to live in peace, we'd have to move and there wasn't a moment to spare. Obviously, I said no. There was no way in hell that I was about to just pack up and move to another country. My poor Will needed help, and he needed it badly. The Will didn't seem to see things that way, and I had no idea just how badly he'd take my refusal. For those of you that don't know how it feels to be stabbed by someone you've once believed would never ever hurt you, I hope it stays that way for you. Luckily, mine was just a superficial wound, but the one Will inflicted on the first person who tried to stop him, that wasn't so superficial. Neither was the head injury Will received when he hit the pavement after getting tasered into submission. I didn't press any charges, but the same couldn't be said for the good Samaritan who saved my life. I don't begrudge him the right, I just wish things could have transpired differently. My poor Will is currently serving a five-year sentence for aggravated assault, and although we're no longer together, I still write to him from time to time. He's not a bad person, never was. He just made some very poor decisions, and we both have the scars to prove it.
Back when I was studying for my master's degree, I was living in a rented townhouse with an old college friend. She worked full-time hours while I picked up odds and ends at a local coffee shop, meaning she could cover her costs with ease while my wages only just covered half of the rent. She was always okay with supporting me in that sense. She pretty much paid for everything, whereas I merely pitched in with groceries occasionally. I felt like a total bum sometimes, but she'd always cheer me up whenever I did and explain that it'd be me paying for bougie things once I had some fancy high salary job. She was an amazing friend to me in that way, and we lived like that for almost two years. Until one day, she sat me down for a little talk. She'd fallen in love and planned to get married. The only thing was, they'd met online and the guy lived out in Sacramento. They'd already discussed living situations and he'd made it clear that he couldn't relocate due to his mom's poor health. So after thinking it over for a week or two, she decided to move to California so she could be with him. I was happy for her, don't get me wrong. It sounded completely insane at first, but then the more we talked it over, the more it became obvious that she was crazy about him and from what she told me, I couldn't blame her. He sounded like Mr. Wright, all right, and as sad as I was to see her leave, I knew that she was able to look after herself. But then there was the problem of rent. There was no way that I'd be able to pick up enough hours to cover all the costs, not completely anyway, so if I wanted to carry on living in what was a pretty nice place, I'd have to ask the landlord about finding myself a roommate. The landlord sympathized and agreed to help me find a roommate, but insisted on being part of the vetting process. Obviously, that's their prerogative, and I trusted them to find someone reliable and chill, but I was still sort of nervous about the process of living with some total stranger. A few weeks go by, my old college friend moves out, and I'm just waiting on the landlord to be in touch about my new roommate. I texted her about it, and she replied with something like, almost on meeting with potentials should hear from me in the next few days. It had all been agreed that I'd continue to pay 50% of the rent should the landlord fail to find anyone before it was next due, so I wasn't worried about the time scale or anything. I just sat back, carried on with my work and studies, and just waited to meet my new roomie. And then a few days later, just like my landlord had said, there's an unexpected knock on the front door. Outside on the step is a real plain looking guy in his late 30s or early 40s. He's got boxes under each arm, a big smile on his face and addresses me by name as he introduces himself as my new roommate. I was a little taken aback because my landlord hadn't given me any advanced word about anyone moving in but since it fit with this whole time scale that he'd given me of a few days and the guy seemed to know me by name, I figured that it was all legit. I kept the door open for the guy as he started to move some of the smaller boxes out of a U-Haul that he had outside, but as he sort of did all that, by himself, I crept off into the kitchen to call the landlord. They didn't pick up the call, so I just left a text and then got back to what I was doing. The next thing I know, I hear the sound of a drill coming from downstairs. I go check it out, wondering why the hell this guy might need a power tool to get his stuff moved in, and it's not the guy at all. It's a locksmith, and they're changing the locks. Again, I'm a little taken aback, but once the locksmith told me that he had a new key ready for me and that he'd been hired by the landlord on account of the new tenant, I just nodded and went back to what I was doing. Only once the guy had moved all of the stuff in and there was a new front door lock did the landlord manage to get back to me. Not out of negligence either, just out of how busy they were. I asked them if they'd chosen a roommate and they said yes that they'd be over in the next few days to move in. They hadn't picked up the key yet, but they let me know as soon as they did, so I knew when to expect them. I remember kind of freezing as if to be like, oh no. And then I just asked my landlord, did you have the locks changed? When they replied with a confused no, I think I just about sighed all the air out of my body and over the course of the next few minutes, we established what should have been obvious from the get-go. A total stranger had just moved into this house with me, and my landlord had absolutely zero clue who this person was. We agreed that I should call the cops and get the guy arrested for trespassing, and although it had severely freaked me out at first, the fact that he knew my name gave us a huge clue as to who he was. 
My landlord had mentioned me to a number of the potential tenants, one of whom was a man in his late 30s to early 40s, who sounded a lot like the guy who had just so brazenly invaded my home. My landlord thought that his name was Brad or something like that, and he hadn't been anywhere near a favorite to move in. But apparently, Brad had taken it upon himself to do just that. When the cops showed up, I expected them to walk in, arrest the guy, then drag him out by his arms. After all, he had zero evidence that he even lived there, and I was ready to get the landlord on the phone to prove it. But then the cops walked into his bedroom, talked to him for like 20 minutes, and then came out looking exhausted. Brad had shown them a lease, signed by two parties, meaning from their end everything just seemed absolutely kosher. I told them that it was impossible, that whatever documents he'd showed them had to be fake, but they explained that it wasn't theirs to judge. On top of that, all the legal stuff had to go through the landlord, not me, so once again, I had to just sit back and wait while this total stranger and obvious psychopath slept just feet away from me on the other side of the wall. Problems came almost immediately, with the first being his refusal to pay for utilities. This resulted in us getting the power shut off for an entire day until I literally begged friends and family for a few bucks here and there, until I finally had enough to get the lights turned on again. Meanwhile, Brad, I had honestly never did figure out his name, just kind of made do. He made a show of it too, as if to say, nothing you can do with me to make me move out of here. Again, you think once we proved that his lease was fake that the cops would just come and arrest him, but after living in a place for a certain amount of time, city law states that they're legally a tenant, meaning you can't just throw them out. You need to go get an eviction notice, which again takes time, and all the while the landlord is losing money and I'm losing my mind. It looked like we were going to have to just live like that too, in a kind of legal, social nightmare for the foreseeable future. But in the end, we got a lucky break. Well, lucky in some ways, unlucky in others. There was a long, slow build-up to it, but eventually I started screaming at Brad and getting in his face, and he hit me. And he hit me so hard enough that he actually drew blood, which finally was what I needed to actually get him arrested, and in that time, me and my landlord jumped into action. In our city, there's a statute or precedent or whatever legal thing which states that an emergency eviction notice can be served if a tenant is convicted of a violent crime. We'd obviously have to wait for a court date and maybe even an eventual guilty verdict for that, but thankfully, it came in due course and we were able to evict him. To this day, I still can't believe someone would be so brazen as to do something like that, and I still count myself lucky that things didn't escalate beyond just common assault. Because something tells me that Brad is capable of way worse stuff than that. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm Eastern Standard Time. And there are super fun live streams every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday night that I'd love to see you at. So if you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit r slash letsreadofficial and you might even hear your story featured in the next video. If you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories and big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember... Why did the chicken really cross the road?